Welcome, everyone, to Life on the Bubble. I'm Andy Katz, pleased to be joined by Seth Greenberg, uh, my fellow co-host, friend, colleague. And Seth, before we look back on the first week of the NCAA tournament, uh, some headline news. But even before that, it's related to the headline news. I have to serve up some crow because on this very podcast, I said that Purdue definitely was going to beat FTU. <laughs> so I was completely wrong. You no did. respect to Harvard on a hack and sack. It's typical, Eddie. It's typical. You know, you always, you know, you're kind of a blue blood in himself. You know, Boston College elitist, New England guy. I mean, I understand that. But, you know, in the end, hardest playing, toughest team finds a way to win. I told you we were going to get up and underneath Purdue. I told you we were going to spread out Purdue. I told you that, you know what, the grit and grime and toughness of Fairleigh Dickinson would persevere. You gave it no credit. You basically dissed me. You were the elitist of that New England, you know, mindset. And you know what? The tough, gritty guys at from Harvard on a Hackensack got it done. And not only did they get it done, Andy, but after they got it done, my guy, Toby Anderson, who did in 10 months, in 10 months, went from Harvard on a Hackensack to basically New Rochelle and the head coach of Iona because the obviously the Coaching carousel is in full swing, and Iona did a great job not wasting any time hiring the right guy. He had great success, obviously, in that area. Doesn't even have to move. Uh, style of play will be the same. Tobin Anderson did an amazing job of developing an identity and a culture of Fairleigh Dickinson in 10 months. So happy for him, disappointed for the university, but so happy for him now that Rick Bettino is on his way to St. John's. You know what? Iona has got a terrific basketball coach that will do a great job at Iona. So let's hold the thought on the Purdue game because we're going to get to that headline of the East here in momentary. But since you brought up the coaching carousel, obviously it's been in the Northeast that are the dominoes that are significant. Um, Rick Patino must be drinking from the fountain of youth because <laughs> he does not age and he's got the fire in the belly. He looks great. He's in great shape uh, and he's ready to go at St. John's and revive the program yet again. Uh, we all kind of thought this would happen, but it actually is happening. What do you think about Patino back at Madison Square Garden, was once the head coach of the Knicks, and back in the Big East? It's a home run hire. I mean, Rick Patino will do an incredible job. They will compete for the best players. They'll play a style of basketball that is attractive. Madison Square Garden will be rocking. If they play some games in Karnasek Arena, it'll be a tough ticket. Uh, Rick Pitino is not a good coach. He's a great basketball coach. That's just the way it is. Now, look, things are going to change in Jamaica, Queens, because he's going to walk into those offices and he's going to walk into that practice facility and it's going to be unacceptable. And what he's going to do is people talk about NIL. You see what you do if you want NIL, if you're at St. John's, all right? You leave Jamaica, you get on the LIE, you go through the tunnel, you make a left. There's a little thing called Wall Street. Right. The last time I checked, even in the dark of stays, there's a lot of cash over there. All right. There's a lot of St. John's alums over there. There are a lot of friends of Rick Patino over there. And you know what? NIL will not be a problem. The next problem will be facilities. Madison Square Garden is great. They got to have their own locker room in Madison Square Garden. That will be done. All right. Jamaica, Queens, nice place. But you know what? They're going to have to upgrade everything. They're going to have to upgrade how the players are living. They're going to have to update the practice facility. They're going to have to upgrade the offices. They're going to have to upgrade the film room. They're going to have to basically invest. Your investment equals your expectation. And they're going to have to make that investment. They made the investment in Rick Pitino. He's going to do the job he needs to do. They're going to win. But you also still need bells and whistles. He's the perfect guy because he will be able to raise money, attract recruits, pack Madison Square Garden, and create an energy at St. John's they have not had since Luke Hornacek. I agree 100% everything you're saying. I think it'll be a home run. Now, the other one, uh, I'm really interested to hear your take on this because there's a lot of Providence fans, and you can tell from the administration, from the comments, they're upset mm -hmm. that Ed Cooley went from PC to Georgetown. Now, two comments there. One, you can't compare the history, history obviously, and the potential money uh, and resources, Georgetown and Providence. We've come to a point where it used to be you couldn't transfer within a league. Now it happens all the time. Player one could be at, you know, 
Michigan, he can go to Michigan State, vice versa, Michigan, Ohio State. That stuff happens all the time, every league. Um, so if it happens at the player level, and by the way, Rick Patino did the ultimate, even though he didn't do, do it directly. Uh, you know, he went from Kentucky to Louisville with a stop in the NBA, but still arch rivals. Mike Montgomery, by the way, arch rivals, went Stanford to Cal, maybe not direct, but still arch rivals. So uh, it has happened, uh, and players do it. Um, your thoughts on a coach doing it here within the Big East? Yeah, the Big East is a little bit of a fraternity. So, you know, I think that's why people are a little bit up in arms. But having said that, um, you know, Ed Cooley, the people of Providence should be thankful for the time Ed Cooley spent there. People of Providence should say, you know what? We had a terrific coach that revived our program. We supported him. We paid him. We built him facilities. <clears throat> but, you know, they, they, sometimes change is good. And he did an amazing job. But resources are not just facilities. They're also resources in terms of history, tradition, NIL, and everything else. It's the business of college basketball has changed. The economy of college basketball has changed. The economy in Washington, D.C. and Georgetown is much different than the economy in Providence, Rhode Island. That's just the way it is. Ed wants to chase a national championship. I guess he thinks he has a greater chance to do it there. He loved his time at Providence. He did amazing things. It's his hometown. It'll ne town. It'll never be his home. Uh, not be his hometown. It hurts me a little bit in that the perception is going to be he walked out on Providence. Except the perception should be thank you, Ed, for what you did to bring us to the point we are today. We will be able to now attract another good coach that hopefully can carry on your legacy. But good luck to you. We're going to compete like hell to try to kick your ass, but we wish you well. That's what should happen. And, and by the way, I know it was player <laughs> coach, but his, one of his mentors, the late, great John Thompson, player of Providence, obviously Hall of Fame coach at Georgetown. So similar path, just different, you know, not coach, coach, but player coach. Uh, one last one that I just want to say something you can say if you want. Um, this happened obviously last week. Way go to McNeese State, whatever. That's, that's fine. Um, it's a lower one bid league kind of thing. They want to hire him. That's fine. Whatever. Um, I still say that I am really surprised that Chris Beard ended up in the SEC at Ole Miss this soon. Yes, charges were dropped, but no one disputes that this didn't happen. Uh, and my thing is, I just don't think Chris Beard can be Beard off the court. He can be his coach, you know, as good a coach as he always was at Texas Tech in Texas. He can be a great coach. I don't think he can be the same person off out in the community, you know, getting the students with his shtick, which I was a part of. I went on the fireside chat many times. Um, but I just don't think he can be that person front facing for the university. And I'll be very intrigued to see how it goes forward uh, on the off court stuff and how he represents Ole Miss. I totally agree with what you said of Chris Beard. Hopefully he, he sought the help he needed to seek. Uh, hopefully he, uh, he learned a, a very, very valuable lesson. Um, it is what happened. Uh, I haven't talked to Chris, so I don't know exactly what happened, but I was surprised that at such a high profile university uh, in such a quick time period uh, would hire him, but the SEC, it just means more. And dovetailing off of that, come on, Texas, hire Rodney Terry full-time. He's in the Sweet 16, and we're going to get to Texas, obviously, when we look ahead. All right, let's go back to the East because we brought it up at the top. Um, you're the coach. I'm the journalist, the guy that's watched the game for 35 years or more, uh, 40 years. I'm, I'm dating myself, but it's all true. 40-plus, uh, I don't know. I'm, uh, you know, over 50. Uh, I still don't understand – how Zach Eady took one field goal in the final 13 minutes um, and how the Purdue guards continue to try to go off that high ball screen. They weren't athletic enough to go by the F guards. Uh, it wasn't working. Why do they keep trying it? Uh, you're right. F you had a and, and, and I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. Okay. I'm going to stop you right there. Andy, I understand where you're coming from, but like, here's the deal. You got to make shots. I mean, to me, this is a mental thing as anything else. And you think about this Purdue team, they got good shots. Mason Gillis made nine threes in a game. He was afraid to shoot the basketball. Uh, 
Purdue's got to get through this mental block of these close games against these teams that they should dominate. Now, look, the other guy's trying to win also. We talked about style of play. Style makes fights, imposing your identity. Charlie Dickinson did that. They punched Purdue right in nose. Purdue basically didn't punch back. They backpedaled. They need to be the aggressor. Now, could they show some agility and change defenses? Sure, they could have. They could, but that's not who they are. You know, they want to impose their identity on the game as well and their inability to do that. And then they basically got gunshot. Uh, you know, Forrest lawyer, uh, Fletcher Lawyer at the end, at least he let a couple fly and he knocked down a couple of jumpers. But they were on their heels a good portion of that game. And that's just the way it is. And this is something Matt's got to get through. Uh, as a team, they got to get through. Matt Painter is a great basketball coach. No dispute. He's a great basketball coach. Uh, and, you know, for the people at Purdue, oh, no. Yeah, try to do what he's done. It's your body of work. All right? They, they, you know what? They've laid a couple of eggs. That's just the way it is. Coach K's laid eggs. Roy Williams has laid eggs. I mean, we've, we've seen Bill Self has laid eggs. You know, they said Jay Wright couldn't win a national championship, couldn't win a big game. He's got two national championships. It's going to happen at Purdue. So Purdue fans, just relax a little bit. All right, Seth, I kind of want to put a bow because there were big names in the East that did not advance to the Sweet 16. You can go through them, but I, I think I, I'm interested to hear what you think of Memphis, Kentucky, Marquette, and Duke. Those four had really good, well, big names, a couple really good seasons within that four and didn't advance. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think Kentucky, uh, you know, I thought everyone's going to lose their mind on John Calipari. I thought that this team wasn't overly talented. You had, obviously, the returning player of the year. Uh, you had injuries that impacted their ability to continue to improve. I thought they actually started to play better at the end of the season. I thought the ball in case in Wallace's hands was a positive. you got to give Kansas State credit, 100%. Back-to-back big threes. Keontae Johnson, who couldn't make a shot all game, knocks down one three. Masood makes a three from the hash mark, and then – Look, I mean, Kentucky's not winning when, you know, their backcourt shoots about two for 100. That's just the way those, those they could make a shot. Antonio Reeves, who was so good in the opening round game, could not make a shot. Uh, Duke, they ran into a very physical Tennessee team. Tennessee, Tennessee set the stage of that game in the first play of the game when the ball went up and Plopsic absolutely took Kyle Filipowski out. Tennessee won that game. I don't want, don't at me, don't complain. I'm not saying Tennessee didn't win the game. Combo was absolutely terrific. They won the game. The first five minutes of that game was officiated horrifically. That's just the way it is. They set the tone. They redefined what a foul was early. And you know what? That carried over through the rest of the game. Having said that, Tennessee won that basketball game. They outplayed Duke in every aspect. Duke looked like a young, inexperienced team in relation to a mature Tennessee team. And then Marquette, I mean, that was vintage Tom Izzo. Great guard play, physical defense, rebound the basketball. Did a great job on Tyler Kolick. Tyler Kolick was the Big East player of the year. I don't get into, the, you know, January, February, Izzo. That, that's all BS. You know what? Tom Izzo coaches in every month. And Marquette had a great and, regular season and postseason. They won the Big East. Shock is smart, yeah. coach of the year, finalist for the Naismith. One last thing before we get out of the East. Memphis, obviously a tough way to lose to FAU. Um, look, Penny Hardaway, all the things that were going sideways with them, he got them back in the tournament, and they were in position to win, uh, you know, with Kendrick Davis, who had a really good season, didn't have a great end of the game, but still had a really good year for Memphis. Yeah, I, th- I thought Penny did a good job. I, th- I thought this was Penny's best team. Yeah, beat he really did. I thought it was his best team. Look, and Kendrick Davis having a point guard. Obviously, is huge in in regards to that, and you know, again, you've got to give tip your hat to someone. This is the NCAA tournament, right? I mean, you're going to play a good team, and you're going to have to play well to win, and that's just the way it is. And you say, well, you know, it's a mid major. Well, no, you know, this time of the year, everyone's in the same conference. Everyone's in the same conference. I don't care. Teams that won thirty games, teams that won thirty games, expect to win, and that's what we've seen throughout the tournament. All right, so before we look ahead. Um, no, let's go to the South now. No, no, no. I, I was going to say that. In the South, uh, to me, the big storylines of the two teams that didn't advance that maybe were supposed to, you know, were Arizona and Virginia. Uh, what would you think of the way those seasons ended? 
I thought Virginia was who they were. They were a team that struggled offensively. Virginia uh, lost a game that Virginia's, you talk about small margin of error. Virginia's margin of error was minuscule. It was absolutely minuscule. And, you know, they were a team that could get stuck offensively. They were a team that wasn't as good as they'd been defensively. Uh, Virginia losing didn't, I got to be honest with you, it didn't blow my mind. It really didn't. Furman's a team that has two players that can play anywhere in the country. And Slauson and Bothwell and, and Pegues, to be honest with you. Uh, and they came up with a really good game plan. Having said that, if someone told me that Kia Clark, the guy that threw the greatest assist in Virginia history, was going to make that decision as a fifth-year senior with a timeout in his pocket, I'd say of all the guys that are going to play college basketball in the NCAA tournament in the first round, he'd be the last guy that would have made that decision. It's unfortunate. They had the game won, and they didn't close it. That's just the way it is. And I feel for Kia Clark because I just hope that's not his memory. His memory needs to be the incredible career he had. His memory needs to be that unbelievable decision to make the pass to Mamadi Dikite and not a horrific decision he made at the end of that game. Uh, Arizona, we said guard play all season long. We said our, that was their Achilles heel, guard play all season long. And people poo-pooed it. Oh, they got the high-low game. They got the, you know, Travellis is running the court. Oh, you hate Arizona. No. Second half, I mean, they didn't make a three, three assists, nine turnovers. Their guard play was subpar. Uh, both of their guards, whether it's Chris or Courtney Ramey, both played more on emotion than with poise and presence. And they beat, they lost to a team that could win again because Prince is not a joke. I think the, the storyline is we talk about Kansas State, we talk Princeton. Think about this. No NIL, because if you make NIL money, it goes towards your, your self-help package. No transfer portal. No COVID year. They got a really good team. They got a really good team. Pierce rebounds the ball. What is it? Long, long bro knocks down shots. Awana is a six foot eight point center. They're superbly coached. So tip your hat to Princeton. Bill Bradley and the crew. Move on. Watch out, Final Four. Kazan Russell, you're next. All right, in the Midwest, uh, I'm just curious, uh, you know, I, I <clears throat> with Indiana, I, I, you know, there's so many times this year I thought they were a team that could win the whole thing when they played well. I saw what you talked about on game day with TJD and, you know, him taking over. And uh, and then defensively, they, they have these lapses. I mean, Miami played great, so I don't want to take anything away from Miami. But this Indiana team never could consistently put together two, three, four really good games in a row. The last 12 games, they were six and six. Win one, lose one. Win one, lose one. Win one. They couldn't validate a win. I mean, that's plain and simple. They couldn't validate a win. When they defended, they were really good. When they didn't defend, they weren't as good. Plain and simple. Uh, Jalen Hutchfino, decision making early in the game, the, their inability to really lock in and focus and be ready to play. Having said that, Miami's really good. You know, Nigel Pax learned out where his shots are coming from. Isaiah Wong scores at all three levels. Jordan Miller is a matchup nightmare. Norchad Amir is the best player this year in the portal. He's the, for his team, he's the most productive player this year in the portal. You take him off the team, they got no chance. 17 rebounds. And then Wuga Poplar, he just defends and runs around, makes a couple of shots, gets to the basket. You know, Harlan Beverly, all the guys that come off the bench, do what they do. They're superbly coached. They play with a great pace and space in terms of uh, putting guys in positions to make plays. They keep it simple. And, and, and the next game will be two coaches that keep it simple. And no one is having more fun coaching their team than Jim Laranaga. And the last team just to put a bow on that I thought was significant, obviously, was the other number one that went down, and that was Kansas. It's really unfortunate that Bill Self couldn't coach in the tournament. He was recovering from having a, a stent put in. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was there, but he wasn't coaching. And, and Norm has always done a good job, Norm Roberts, when he's filled in. But it's disappointing that they weren't able to advance, have a chance to, to defend their national championship. So, again, Florida will hold that. 6 07, last time anyone has won back-to-back. -back. What are your thoughts on the season that Kansas had that came to an abrupt end to Arkansas? 
They lose two lottery picks, and they're right there, not going to endure to have a chance to win a national championship. Um, I think it's, again, tip your hat to Arkansas. And it wasn't Nick Smith, and it wasn't Anthony Black. Uh, it was Jordan Walsh, because his defense in the second half was phenomenal. His ability to back tap that missed free throw and keep it alive was phenomenal. But in the end, it was Ricky Council and Devo Davis. Devo Davis who left the team early in the season because he kind of couldn't figure out what his role was going to be and his playing time. Eric Musselman gets his team ready to play in the tournament. He gets them on the same page. Uh, he's relentless. He's nutty. There should be an NCAA rule. It should be a violation for him to take off his shirt. But uh, it should be like maybe a, a game suspension if he takes off his shirt again. But give Arkansas credit. They were relentless. They came after him. The change of saying, you know what, Eric Musselman saying, Nick Smith, Great, you're an All-American. You're going to be a lottery pick. You can sit right by me. All right, this is the line that gives us the best chance to win. And playing it, impressive. Impressive. That's coaching. All right, so in our next podcast, we're going to look ahead at the Sweet 16. Uh, we're in the South. You've got Alabama, San Diego State, and you've got Princeton taking on Creighton in the East. <clears throat> we've got FAU, Tennessee. Michigan State, K-State in the West. we got a rematch between UCLA and Gonzaga and Arkansas taking on UConn. And then the Midwest, it's Texas, Xavier, and Houston, Miami. That's all looking ahead in the Sweet 16. We'll get to that in our next episode.